Sir, poche parole. I, I'm going to tell a few words about, about you, but don't worry. Don't bad words. So you, can, you can come here. Il professore è britannico, è scozzese, nasce come matematico, però non vi proporrà soltanto sterili e noiosi numeri. Confidate. Sir? Um, it's there. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, it was a very impressive start. I'm full of admiration for the beginning of the meeting. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, providing uh, any kind of manifesto. Uh, but when I saw the, the very fine concept for this conference, uh, it encouraged me to think about sources of inequality and what can be done about them. Now, inequality is very much my subject as an economist, and I have almost always looked at the possibilities of taxation as a way of reducing inequality. My instinct was that you probably didn't want to hear me talk about what a good idea it would be to have more taxation. But anyway, not, not in Italy, that's clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's interesting when you consider the sources of inequality uh, when you, you realize how much inequality really comes from differences in jobs. People do different kinds of jobs. Uh, and uh, of course, we can see inequality is associated with uh, some people having better paid jobs than others. Uh, when I talk about jobs, obviously, I include things like uh, being a successful or an unsuccessful entrepreneur, as well as uh, somebody who has a fixed employment, like a professor. And a lot of what we see as inequality in wealth comes from the inequalities of jobs. People have saved from high incomes and that has made them very wealthy. Other people have not been able to and are not. So uh, I think we, we usually believe that most inequality actually arises from differences in the kinds of jobs people are doing rather than uh, by pure luck. Well, luck comes into the kind of job you get, but uh, th th there are a few people who win the lottery and that makes them very rich, but this is a small part of the, of the whole. Uh, and then it uh, occurred to me that economists don't think enough about the extent to which people get better jobs because they've been selected by tests or examinations or by interviews, uh, at any rate, not by the sorts of tools that we think of in economics. Uh, we're always saying, oh yes, that people are allocated to jobs uh, because uh, you've uh, somehow or other paid more for a particular kind of job so as to attract people of particularly high abilities. But how did people get these skills in the first place? That's the issue. And uh, th this is what people are thinking about when they say, uh, maybe what we should be looking for is equality of opportunity rather than simply equality of outcomes. Uh, what, what is equality of opportunity? Uh, I think that's not so clear once you start looking at it. Uh, 
And uh, as, since I've started from this position of looking at choosing people for jobs by using various selection tools, like having people go through a university course, having them pass exams of one kind or another, uh, having them stand in front of an interviewing panel for perhaps quite a long time and perform in a particular way. Uh, th these are all entirely different dimensions from uh, asking people, well, what, what pay do you need if we're going to attract you? How could we create equality of opportunity in this? Well, uh, I, I should say straight away that uh, my thoughts today have been stimulated very much by really very surprising statistics that I learned only last year that in some Asian countries, specifically South Korea and Taiwan, the proportion of the age group who have uh, education beyond secondary school, mainly university education, college education, uh, further education, is 100% uh, or more of the age group, at least that's what the statistics say. Uh, in other words, almost everybody, as they grow up, goes on beyond full secondary education, and uh, probably to age 2021, they're still getting education in some form. Of course, many people are going on beyond that. And the obvious question is, what, what does that do for the society? Now, these seem to be societies where you may say equality of opportunity is uh, virtually complete because everyone is being allowed to follow these channels of uh, third stage education. And... Uh, they are therefore able to compete for many of the kinds of jobs that uh, were referred to in the introductory speech, uh, where uh, in, in Italy it was reported that uh, barely over 8% of uh, working class get to these kinds of jobs, which are the jobs that you are prepared for if you go through this further education level. So I wanted to pursue the thought further and ask what, uh, what is possible? Is this something that uh, other countries should be trying to achieve as well? Uh, and you might indeed consider that this is the kind of thing that is going to and is making South Korea, Taiwan very competitive in many of the kinds of things that uh, Italy would be inclined to compete in. And uh, beyond that, of course, uh, this whole philosophy of uh, equality of access to, the, to education is going to continue all over China and China is a very large world. We may see quite a lot of it in India as well. Uh, China is already getting very high grades in the PISA tests for the measure of educational achievement in schools in the major cities like Shanghai. And uh, most urban parents and many rural parents in China are very keen to send their children into further and higher education after school. So I think we're going to see something comparable in China quite soon. Uh, you might think that 
uh, is just too much competition to bear, but I don't think so. Um, once we start thinking of this as a, as a policy issue, uh, it seems obvious that assigning people to jobs on the basis of tests, uh, which are carried out usually in the educational system, but also that this is quite big business in the industrial world as well. Um, we have to compare that with uh, just letting people get to jobs and see how they do. Uh, one reason that we have considerable inequality is, of course, that people are actually assigned to, to jobs on the basis of tests. And I assume that uh, the tests work reasonably well, although there's a great deal of uncertainty associated with it. So in a simple sense, assigning by tests seems to be clearly better than just randomly putting people into jobs. Uh, if you didn't have this system of education and training with lots of exams, if you speed up the whole process and simply give people instruction, uh, then you would no longer be assigning people to jobs by uh, a more or less scientific attempt to discover who is very able in advance. You just discover by observing on the job. Uh, that would probably lead to more equality, more equality of outcomes. And uh, I, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about attempts to do something like that. So it's, it's not to be rejected completely because if what you really care about is, is equality, then uh, maybe this whole business of tests isn't quite so appealing. You might give up some efficiency in the system for the, the, the sake of uh, letting people all truly have a, an opportunity. But, of course, the opportunity has to be random because there are only a certain number of jobs that uh, require particular abilities. And that's what I want to emphasize. Uh, that my awareness of, the, of this issue, that we can't all have the same in all kinds of important ways, creates a, a necessary inequality in our experience. Uh, I'm going to give you two examples that are quite different from what I'm really particularly interested in now, but you can see that it's the same kind of thing. Um, we can't all live in the same distance from our work. Uh, not everybody can uh, live in a very convenient place in the center of the city where you can walk comfortably to work, uh, just because there isn't room for everybody to be there. So, in fact, we have a necessary inequality of experience between uh, people who live a long way from their work and people who live nearby. Of course, because we have uh, considerable inequality of income, uh, we, uh, uh, we have a sort of sorting as to where people are on that basis. But even if everybody had the same income, it would have to come out differently. Uh, but uh, a more striking case is when you think of uh, something like medical care, medical treatment. Uh, inevitably, different doctors and surgeons have different success rates. Uh, this is particularly clear with surgery because you can actually measure it. And uh, the, the difference of course, is, is very largely related to how much experience the surgeon has. So it's not something that you can easily get rid of. Uh, obviously, the surgeon has to practice. He has to have attempted the operation uh, frequently before, and eventually he will have a very high success rate. The question obviously arises, who gets the most experienced 
surgeon and who gets the beginner. And there has to be inequality in, in what people get. Uh, it's exactly the same sort of uh, situation with, with jobs. Jobs that, are, re that require particular skills. There may be plenty of people who could actually do these if they had enough training, but uh, we don't need them all. So it looks as though you're going to have, uh, in some sense, quite a lot of inequality no matter what you do, even if you follow the kind of policy that, uh, as I said, South Korea and Taiwan have been following of giving people more or less as much education and training as you can fit in. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what's the nature of this training and education that people are getting. It seems to me that there are two different major things you get by getting a lot of training. Uh, one of these, and it, it's the most common, is that uh, as you get trained, say, at a university or, or a similar institution, you are supposed to be able to handle problems at a, a more and more general level. Uh, before you start, you would maybe have to be given very detailed instructions uh, for what you should do at some task so that you uh, may be put on a, cons uh, a construction line to uh, put something together uh, as lots of people, uh, particularly in China, still spend a lot of their time just putting things together. They have to be given rather precise instructions on what they should do. And of course, if you're given these precise instructions, it doesn't take very long and you don't need very much training. As you're trained, what is it that happens? Well, it then becomes possible with a more highly educated person to give them instructions of the form uh, go away and uh, in the course of the day or maybe in the course of the week find a way of, uh, uh, well, it, it might be uh, creating an attractive looking dress or something of that kind. Uh, that's a very generalized instruction and it, and it requires quite a lot of training before you can actually do it. Uh, of course, it, the, the most advanced level of this is when you tell the prime minister of the country to uh, reduce unemployment to a reasonable level and uh, you think that that is going to have to in involve uh, a, a lot of detailed development instructions given to other people and so on and that is what education is essentially doing. Uh, just as uh, well of course I'm most aware of how this works in the context of universities where uh, you're asked to, to do a course of training in, say, microeconomics in 16 or 32 lectures, something of that kind. And uh, you, you simply have to go away and work it out for yourself as to exactly what you're going to do. Uh, there would be an alternative way of doing it, of having a, a detailed book of instructions that uh, people could follow. And provided they had learned to read, and clearly there are uh, detailed requirements of that, that they should understand the language in, in detail, uh, that then uh, they really don't have to go through this form of higher education. Well, I think it's pretty clear that we need this kind of uh, thing. But there is another thing that training is used for, training and education, and that's becoming better at some kind of performance. Because if I, I, I talk about these skills, can you just follow instructions? Well, there are some areas where following an instruction is not particularly easy and requires practice. Uh, if you're 
just tell somebody to uh, play a scale on the piano with two hands all the way up the keyboard, uh, then uh, it's going to take them a while before they can actually do this, and they're going to have to repeat. Some people will have to repeat again and again. So that, there are these two different kinds of things that training can achieve. One is to reduce the detail of instructions that are needed, and this clearly makes people much more valuable in terms of what they can do with their time. And it can also improve performance skill. It can get people playing tennis very well, or it can get people uh, playing a musical instrument very well. Uh, both of these things have the characteristic that it's clear how longer training can achieve more. And equally, it seems as though it's only going to work up to a point. Uh, it occurs to me that a very serious issue, if you're interested in equality of opportunity, is then uh, whether the, the big difference between people is that uh, many people can only reach a particular point and that's that. Or rather that uh, there are some people where it takes a lot longer for them to reach a particular level of skill, either in instruction, following instructions or in performance at, uh, say, a musical instrument. Uh, it seems to me very plausible and I, I think the first thing to say is we really don't know the answer to that. I haven't come across any empirical information that tells us a lot about that, whether the inequality between people is more in terms of how long it takes them to reach skills or uh, the level that they can reach. But I think uh, the, the experience of the military in training people in different branches might very well be highly relevant to this. Um, and, uh, but even the military don't use different lengths of courses for different people according to speed. Uh, the only example I could think of this is where uh, quite frequently people in school are able to skip classes but it, uh, and uh, move up the school a bit faster. But it doesn't apply to many people. Most countries have a few people arriving at university at the age of 15 or 16, but it's unusual. It's a very small thing. Uh, it seemed to me worth considering whether it ought to be entirely different. So should there be longer courses for the less able? Yes, I rather think there should. And uh, in that way, you would increase the supply, of course. How many training places should there be? Well, the key question here is whether you should set about trying to produce more people at a particular skill level than you actually need. Uh, I, I take as a, an important and leading example here uh, doctors. Now, I don't know the situation in Italy, but I know the situation in America and uh, Hong Kong and to some extent, lesser extent, in Britain. Uh, all of them seem to be countries where there's a restricted supply of doctors through training. And uh, it's clear that that's what doctors want because it keeps the salary of doctors high because they have scarcity value. Um, an alternative way of doing it would be to have a much larger number of people being trained and select on the basis of final test results how many of them actually get to be doctors or, or surgeons, physicians. Uh, what would be the result of that? Well, you'd have better quality because uh, more people in there, you're going to find that for any given level of, of ability, the more people will come out at that level. 
That should also mean that uh, perhaps pay of doctors would be lower, so you could save some money, and you could employ more doctors. Uh, for example, might not be what you wanted to do. And equally, you get frustration for the people who did their medical training and found they couldn't get jobs. Are there any examples of that? Well, yes. Uh, it looks as though training for, of lawyers in Japan is a very clear example, where only quite a small proportion of those who begin training for law actually get jobs as lawyers. So it can be done, and the frustration is no doubt bearable. Uh, and uh, there will, of course, be other jobs that uh, people can then do with their training. Um, that is pretty much what happens in the arts, where uh, particularly the performing arts, and also in sport, really, where you have a lot more people go through the training than can actually reach the full public performance soloist level. But of course, these are areas where we happen to have other activities like teaching, which are quite important. Uh, teaching is indeed a very important element in this because the difficulty, the major difficulty in quickly expanding the number of people who go into higher education or further education would be simply finding the teachers. You can't do it too quickly. Uh, because uh, naturally you're, you're looking for people in the same areas where you're hoping that uh, very skilled people will go into real production as opposed to teaching. Well, what, what kind of policies could we have? Uh, I, I said I would mention the cases uh, I'll take China particularly, but you'll be aware the Soviet Union had a similar kind of problem, where they, uh, at certain stages, pretty much eliminated the, the use of hierarchy, where the universities were closed down, and, uh, it, uh, and even many high schools in China in the Cultural Revolution. And this had quite disastrous effects on the economy, uh, as well as on people. So it's been tried, and it doesn't really work. But uh, having what I've called here overtraining, that's to say having uh, more people trained than you know you're going to need, that should actually reduce skill differences uh, and should increase the number of skilled jobs because, uh, because skilled people should be cheaper just because they'd be competing with one another. It's, probably, it's something that probably happened in a very important way in the first part of the 20th century, where there was a big increase in the number of skilled people, uh, probably because education became much more widespread, and the relative pay of the skilled came down. More recently, it's been going the other way, with uh, the relative pay of skilled people relative to unskilled gone up a lot. So we do have to pay attention to, the, to, to those who will be doing low-skilled occupations. Uh, and uh, that would be a sort of final little stab at the problem. But um, I thought I should mention an argument that one hears from time to time in, in Britain particularly, and also in Australia and New Zealand, where uh, to a large extent people pay for higher education uh, and with unsubsidized uh, prices for higher education now. And in theory, that's egalitarian because uh, you're removing what are effectively subsidies to people who will be quite well off. Uh, I'm still disturbed by the thought that it probably discourages people from coming in to higher education. Uh, so it's enormously important not only that there be loans 
that will pay for people's education. But more important, that there should be a large element of insurance. In other words, people who don't get terribly well-paid jobs after going through university uh, shouldn't have to pay back all of the, the loan that they'd had in the first place. And uh, most systems are, are, are a bit lacking in that. Let's say the people who don't pay back the loans are the people who uh, emigrate to very good jobs somewhere else, which is not exactly the, the group that you want to pay. But there remains that issue if, if indeed one succeeds in greatly increasing the number of skilled people and presumably greatly increasing the use of uh, skilled jobs in industry uh, as opposed to unskilled, that still there will be unskilled jobs. And uh, it's not very satisfactory if these are very poorly paid because there aren't, uh, because there would still be quite a number of people looking for them. Uh, and I, I, that would take me into the very desirable program of subsidizing low-pay jobs, which in any case would have many other payoffs in the current situation with large levels of unemployment amongst the unskilled. And I just remind you that a very large part of unemployment is amongst people with low skills. So uh, any program that is designed to get people to higher skills would probably help, even in circumstances where, to a large extent, uh, the unemployment is because of a lack of jobs rather than a lack of people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Proprio pochissime parole per eh, sintetizzare. Allora, quattro elementi che mi sembra il caso del quale ragionare dopo. Cioè, il primo è che il, il professor Milli.